Hello Life Changes Church, welcome to our YouTube channel. We have got an amazing word prepared for you, so why don't you take out your notebook and your pen as we get ready to listen to what God has for us. Before we get into anything this morning, we're going to read scripture. Let's start with scripture. And now, let me just tell you, I'm going to be reading from the book of James. And you know, when, when you're reading from the book of James, it's a serious thing, yeah? James is a serious dude, uh, and so this is a serious piece of scripture. Um, but it is a beautiful scripture. So let's go. And maybe before we do that, just to reiterate, today, this morning's content is relatively raw. I'm going to share some story. I'm going to share some things. Uh, I know there's some, probably some people in the room that are, this might be shocking to you. But it's also important for you to know some of these things because these things are ravaging our community. Yeah? And we all need to rally together to fight for people's freedom. Amen. Good. God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Wow. Uh, I was hoping there would be a verse there that says, there will be no testing and temptation. But alas, not. In fact, God says, there will be. And that if you endure it, there will be blessing. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Wow, that's incredible. I'm going to skip on a little bit, and I'm going to go to verse 14. Temptation comes from our own desires. Oh, that's a heavy, eh? Which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. Yo, James is a hectic dude. And these are some very hectic scriptures. But if we, give, if we learn to trust God, if we learn to trust in His promises, and that He has freedom awaiting us, then actually this is an incredible scripture. An, incredible, an incredibly freeing scripture. Cool. So let's get into it today, ladies and gents. Today's topic, oh, what a surprise, um, lust and pornography. So it is a very real topic. I want to make a couple of statements before I get into it, and maybe these statements are going to be a little controversial. But I know, I know that there are some of you in the room this morning that are struggling with lust and pornography. I don't know who you are, but I know you're struggling. It is absolutely ravaging our communities. This used to be a topic that was reserved for men's times. You used to have a men's gathering and then you talk about these serious things. This is no longer a men's problem, ladies. It's been proven by statistics, that actually ladies are now just as much prone to the challenges of lust and pornography as men. The pandemic exposed many things. Many things. Some marriages popped. They weren't used to spending so much time together. The one thing it exposed was just how rife pornography is in our world. Some people have referenced and call it the, not the pandemic, but the porndemic. The sheer number of people that were visiting pornography websites during the pandemic are astronomical. The estimates today are that about two and a half million people visit every 60 seconds. Every 60 seconds. So in the course of a day, there are a lot of people. I don't think stats tell the whole story, but the reality is very real. Now, I know that amongst us here, we're people that have made some bad decisions. I'm one of them. I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of those decisions in a bit. But I also know that some of you, decisions were made to you. You didn't make the decision. You were forced into something. Someone forced themselves on you. 
and ultimately you've landed in a place that looks something like this. I want to tell you this morning there's healing for you. Whether you made the bad decisions or they were made against you, there is healing for both. And actually, you're going to see that the healing process is actually very similar. Very similar. We'll get to that at the end. I, um, I think I need to tell you a little bit about my story. But what, when I tell the story, I want you to think about your own life. Because I know for many of you, my story will be similar to yours. I know that for a fact. Yeah? And I know that this topic is a hard topic to hear in church. It's not, it's not easy, but it's very important that we talk about it. So, I grew up in South Africa, obviously. Um, most of you are not going to believe this, but I'm actually 49 years old. I know, I know, I just... It's, I know, it's a shock. Because I, I mean, if I look around the room, I'm guessing you guys thought like 30, 35 max. <laughs> so yeah, 30, Mike, 30, we're sticking with 35. 35, I don't want to push it. You know, if you go too low, it's like people are like, ah, oh, it's too young. Um, but the reality is that it means I grew up in South Africa in the 80s, which was a thinking back. It was a weird time, Yeah. Obviously, we had challenges in this country. One of the realities in South Africa <clears throat> was that pornography was not accessible in the 80s. And that's because there were a number of old Urmis that decided that it is nie for die mense nie. Ons gaan vir die ho. They put it in their drawers. <clears throat> uh, the people can't see this. We will see this. Um, <laughs> that's just a joke. Um, but that was the reality. You couldn't, this stuff was not available. But let me just tell you something, guys. Whether something's available or not, the enemy knows your weakness. He is not a fool, he's not an idiot, yeah? and he knew mine. We so happened to be friends with some amazing people. They were missionaries from the US. Um, they were incredible. And uh, their son was my age, and um, they had a friend or a family member, I forget now, who had come to visit. And guess what he brought with him from America? Wow. Yeah? And so now this friend of mine <clears throat> was ravaged with guilt and shame. He can't, I can't have this thing. Yeah? This magazine. What does he do? He asked me if I want it. Do you want this? So I'm like, yeah, okay. It's, uh, yeah. I mean, I'll keep it for a little while. Obviously, you can't just walk down the stairs with a pornographic magazine in your, under your arm. So what did we do? I cut out the pictures and left the articles. Now, all those old womies that used to tell you they buy the magazines for the articles, they're lying. They're buying them for the naked ladies. Let's just be truthful here. So I took the pictures. And I know it's tongue-in-cheek, but the reality is that started a very long and arduous journey for me. That was the start of my addiction. I lived with this thing for well over 20 years of my life. I, um, pornography and lust consumed me. It consumed every thought, every waking moment, everything I did had an end game. I struggled to be friends with women. I couldn't because this thing owned me. This thing took me in directions I didn't think I would go. That was the reality. I was insatiable. <clears throat> so much so that um, I started going down paths that I didn't think I would. I had sex for the first time when I was 14 years old. Now let me tell you something now, guys. No 14-year-old is meant to be having sex. None. I spent a lot of my time looking for girls 
who needed attention. So I want to tell you now this morning, if you're sitting here this morning and you are a parent, if you're a mom or you're a dad, I want to tell you now it is your responsibility to give your kids the attention that they need. You are the ones. Guys, you are dads in this room. Your girls need to hear it from you, that they are affirmed, that they have identity, yeah, that they are loved. Because if you don't, some scumbag out there is going to take your place. I know that's hard to hear, but it's the truth. Make sure that your kids, especially your girls, know who they are and have identity. I treated women very poorly. And I I still often pray, Lord, I trust that there is forgiveness for me from them. I trust that they are good. Because this thing consumed me so much I did not care how I treated people. Remember, this thing owned me. I remember so clearly, it's amazing how you remember certain things in your life. I remember my first year at university, I was walking down into the main road in Rondebosch, and there was a CNA on the main road, and I went into that CNA because all the dirty magazines were in the corner on the right. And I remember as I walked into that CNA, it hit me, it struck me that I am no longer in control. This thing owns me. This thing is going to take me places I didn't think I would ever go. That is the reality with lust and pornography. Your whole life will become a lie. You cannot be addicted to something and be very truthful at the same time. Those two don't go hand in hand. The reality is if you're addicted to drugs and alcohol, eventually that thing is going to show. You can't hide that forever because physically it shows. The problem with lust and pornography, you could, if you wanted to, hide that your entire life. You could take that thing to the grave. But there is a huge challenge with that. A huge challenge, which I'm going to talk to you about in a minute. I remember when I got married, I remember my first thoughts were, oh, you know, you know what? This thing, once I get married, it'll be cured. <laughs> uh, for those of you who are not married yet, you thought life was difficult before you got married. Life gets tricky after you get married. Life comes at you fast. Yeah? And what happens? You revert to type. That thing did not go away. And I remember telling myself, I would take this thing to the grave. My wife will never know. My kids will never know. It will be my secret. And I know that that is how many of us live today. You can hide this thing if you want to. But here's the challenge, guys. When this thing consumes you, you will never just stay in one place. You are always going to need more. That first search might be, show me the naked, beautiful naked girls on the internet. Trust me, it does not stay there. You will be horrified to know where your mind will take you. It'll take you places you never thought possible. And so that happened with me. As this thing consumed me, I remember getting to a point where I I started to fantasize about getting to the point where, actually, you know what? It's going to be much easier to just pay for it. Then I don't have to be nice to anybody. I don't have to strike conversation. I can literally put money on the table and get what I want. That's where it will lead you. Those are the places it will take you. And I went there. I did just that. Some of you are going, my 
goodness. And he's standing on stage preaching. There's hope. There is hope, people. But let me tell you, this thing is a vicious cycle. A vicious cycle. Because the reality is, just like any addiction, yeah, there's, there's this whole thing around the dopamine hit. We all understand what dopamine is now. So there's this, you need it, you get it, there's ecstasy. Yeah? You kind of feel relieved, you feel good. But that does not last. It lasts for a very short while. Yeah? And then what sets in is the guilt and the shame and the self-loathing. It will set in fast. I, um, the reality is I, I'm actually a very resolute person. When I put my mind to something, it happens. You cannot sway me. Yeah? I've, um, I've, done, I've, I've smoked for a few years. I quit that like that. My wife and I were parting up a storm, doing drugs, doing the whole scene. We quit like that. This thing, I could not quit. In my own power, I was completely and utterly helpless. And this is where I'm going to get quite real, guys. Because when you're, when, when you're captive to lust and pornography, you're not consuming it, closing your laptop and then going and having a coffee. No. This is about self-pleasure. This is about masturbation. And let me tell you something right now. When you are addicted to this stuff, masturbation will take everything from you. It will rob you of your energy and of your passion that was meant for somebody else. It will take it away. And so, yes, you could take this thing to the grave, but you are going to have a terrible marriage because it is going to rob everything from you. Everything that was meant for somebody else, you're going to be doing it to yourself. And guess what? The shame and the guilt will consume you. And here's the thing with shame and guilt, guys. Shame and guilt keeps you small. Shame and guilt keeps you in the corner. I don't know too many people that have made something of their lives that were carrying huge amounts of shame and guilt. Shame and guilt does not allow you to become the person that God called you to be. Shame and guilt keeps you in the corner. It keeps you small. And I know some of you are timid. See, this is the thing with pornography and lust addiction. You're either going to become this insatiable machine that's just going out and getting whatever he or she wants, or you're timid and it will keep you timid. You will never have the courage to speak to a girl, to have a relationship, to do things the right way, because this thing will keep you in the corner. <laughs> I'm going to say it again, pornography will always rob, steal, and destroy. Always. And I know that there might be one or two couples that go, but hang on, we, we do this as a couple. It's just it's to spice things up a little bit. Maybe that's where it starts. But it never stays there. Two reasons. One, there's a good chance that at least one in the couple are going to end up having a problem. And what's going to happen? They're going to take that somewhere else. Number two, marriage is God-ordained. Why do we want to take something so terrible and disgusting and bring it into something that's ordained by God? Yeah? We're just taking something and defiling it completely. It will never stay pure and innocent. It will always become something else when we bring things in that don't belong there. People who are stuck in the cycle of lust and pornography end up living lives of fantasy. They fantasize about everything. It's not just about sexual fantasy. Because what happens is you spend so much time up here that everything stays up here. 
So you end up fantasizing about everything in your life. You fantasize about having a different life. You fantasize about being successful. You fantasize about being wealthy. You fantasize, you fantasize, you fantasize. Nothing ever gets put into action. God called us to have dreams, but those dreams need to be actioned. Those dreams need to have a plan and a strategy so we can go somewhere. If those dreams stay here, and all we do is fantasize about them, we go nowhere. Nowhere. It often starts with sexual fantasy, lust and pornography. But that fantasy, that slow drip poison, will take over every aspect of your life. You will die one day a person that never achieved anything, a person that never became the person that God called them to be because all you did was live a life of fantasy. There is a battle for your mind, and you have to make a decision. Who is going to win the battle? Is it going to be the enemy and a life of fantasy, or is it going to be God and his ordained dreams over your life? You need to decide. The reality is with pornography addiction, it causes severe injuries, just like physical injuries. When you're injured physically, it needs time to heal. You go through a process of healing. Yeah? And most of us are, ha- are fine with that. We understand there's a process. I've, I've injured something and I need to not do a bunch of activities because that thing needs time to heal. Well, here's the thing. When you've been inundating your mind and your soul with so much perversion over years and years and years, you are now carrying around spiritual, mental, and emotional injuries that you need to be healed from. You need to be healed. But here's the thing, and I'm going to talk about the process in a little bit. You need to commit to the process. You need to decide, am I going to trust God or not? If you trust Him, you will do it His way. If you do not, your injuries will never get healed, and you're going to constantly be kicking your toe, constantly be stumbling. Why? Because you haven't trusted him in this process. So, here you sit and you go, well, how then? How do I heal? What is the process? Tell it to me. The reality is, the process is both simple and easy and difficult at the same time. It's both simple and easy and difficult at the same time. Step number one, do not conceal it, confess it. Do not conceal it, confess it. Let's see what the Bible says. Proverbs 28 says this, People who conceal their sins will not prosper. I always think back, that verse haunts me, because I always think back to the the previous me, the me that decided I'm going to keep this stuff to the grave realizing I would not prosper as a human being, as a husband, as a father. But if they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. I want mercy. I remember when I got saved and realized that this is the path to freedom, it scared the living daylights out of me. I still remember having a, a coffee with Brett Anderson. Brett's on the, on the leadership team there at Century City. And I remember asking him some roundabout questions to try and land at an answer because I was like, you know what, Brett, uh, with regards to the confession, is it, is it cool if I just say, Lord, please forgive me, and then we're good to go? He's like, what? No, dude. Yes, we definitely ask for forgiveness from our Heavenly Father. Yeah? We confess our sins to our Father in Heaven. But unfortunately, it does not stay there. We actually need to confess our sins to people, one to another. So here's the thing. When we confess to God, the Scripture says we are forgiven. Okay? So let's, let's have a look at this. It says this in 1 John 1. 
But if we confess our sins to Him, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. Who doesn't want that? Yeah, I look back on my life and I go, all those things that I did, Lord, all of those things, you forgive me and you wash me clean. I want that. I don't want to be that guy anymore. So I ask, I, I, I mean, you may even plead for forgiveness. Not that that's necessary, but you kind of get into that place where you just thought, will you forgive me for everything I've done? But then there's steps of healing that need to take place. And what's quite interesting is the Lord says, this is James 5.16, says, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Now, I think within that process for some people, there is things like counseling. Absolutely. But it says confess to one another. Pray for each other that you may be healed. We're carrying injuries, and they need to be healed. And I know that that thought of confessing to another person may scare the living daylights out of you. I, I think back to when I, I confessed to my wife about my challenges. She was hurt. God says we confess to him there will be forgiveness. But we also have to realize there are still consequences. Our actions have consequences. We have hurt people. That needs to be processed and that needs to be healed. I confessed to her. We met with pastors. And the amazing thing is that God gifted her with a grace to help me in the healing process. How incredible is that? And so some of you are sitting here this morning, and um, can I be honest with you? I know that there's people struggling in the room. I don't expect you to come to the front after the service. Just honest. Because this thing is heavy. But you can. And there is no condemnation. There's no judgment. But some of you are going to take this home with you. And it's going to weigh on you. And at some point, you're going, to, you're going to go, I need to confess now. Some of you might go and call up, make a meeting with a pastor. Some of you might go to your wife or to your spouse and say, I have this problem. Some of you might do it in a life group this week. I don't know. But God says, do not conceal it. Confess it. Bring it out into the open so that you can be free. You are only as strong as you are willing to be honest. You're only as strong as you're willing to be honest. The first step in your healing process, don't conceal it, confess it. The second, you and I cannot fight temptation. The word is very clear. It says run. 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 You may think, oh, you know what, dude, I got this, I got this. I'm going to go a couple of rounds. You might win one or two. You might. But what if it wins one or two? As I stand here before you today, I realize I'm only one bad decision away from messing it all up. I'm no better than anybody else. One bad decision away. We do not fight temptation. We flee from it. Paul is very clear in 1 Corinthians 6. He says, run from sexual sin. Run. Simple. Four words. Run. We did the, the series on Joseph um, was it last year. I've lost track of time. Whenever we did that series, uh, was it this year? It's cool. Um, I've completely lost uh, track. Eh? Um, and, um, you know, Joseph encountered the first real desperate housewife in part of his wife and and i'll bet you remember now joseph was young yeah he, he, he would have uh, there's all the there's loins would have been burning and i bet you part of his wife looked good 
Just be honest. She threw herself at him. What did he do? He ran. Yeah, he ran to honor God and to honor man. He ran. I always think of that story. Always. Because I always think of myself. If I were the young me in that story, would not have run. Run. Do not fight. Run. I'll give you an example of what running might look like. The reality is, I hardly spend any time on social media now. Because social media has become a very different place. Every second auntie on Instagram is an amateur porn star. I'm just being serious. It's not healthy to go down rabbit holes, guys, on things like social media. I'll be honest. Because stuff will come your way. And the enemy knows. He knows. So I don't go there anymore. I leave it. Yeah? That's a form of running. Prevention is better than cure. It's better than cure, guys. Because prevention will prevent you from making that one bad decision that can destroy your family and your life. I'm going to ask you to stand with me this morning. My last, my last point. God's processes are perfect. They're perfect. It may seem scary at first. But I want to tell you something now that confessing and fleeing don't mean that much when you don't have revelation of Jesus. You need an ongoing revelation of the King. I know for a fact that in my walk with Jesus, I've not always been as consistent as I would want to be. And there were times when I drifted away. Not him, me. It's funny how during those times is when suddenly I'm noticing things I never noticed before. But when I'm walking with him, close, when my eyes are fixed on him, I don't know, there's a whole lot of stuff I don't see. It's much easier to run when my eyes are fixed on him. The first words that enter my mind when I wake up in the morning is, Jesus, I need you. Today, I need you. Without you, I may stumble. Can we close our eyes this morning? Jesus, you came to set us free. Father, you sent your Son that we would find freedom. Freedom in every area of our lives. I pray for people in the room this morning, Lord God. If there are people here that are struggling, and you know what struggling looks like? You might think, hey, you know what? Hey, maybe, maybe once every few months. I'm telling you how that's a struggle. If you need to go there, it's a struggle. But Jesus, Jesus came to set you free. He came to show a better way. What the enemy feeds us is counterfeit. He feeds us falsehoods. He feeds us lies. You need this thing. No, you don't. No, you do not. Jesus, the Father, has such a beautiful plan for your life. But the question is, do you trust him? Do you trust him? For the young single people in the room, do you trust him for your future? Do you trust him? Because if you trust God and for your future, you won't give things away very easily. If you've lived a life that looks something like mine, there is freedom for you. There is freedom waiting for you. Say yes to Jesus, confess your sin, and find freedom. Thank you, Lord. 
Thank you, Jesus. That you have made a way for every single one of us. No matter where we're at, you have made a way, Lord. What an amazing, amazing word. If you would like to find out about what's happening in the life of the church, why don't you follow us on our social media, Instagram or Facebook, or you can go into our website, lifechanges.org.za. Thank you so much for watching that video. Be blessed.